Welcome to the Dental Implant Practices Podcast, where each episode will explore how to integrate dental implants into your practice and into bone with your host, Dr. Philip Gordon. Welcome back to another episode of the Dental Implant Practices Podcast. I'm your host, Philip Gordon, and today it's a uh, special honor for me to introduce our guest, Dr. Paul Homily. Dr. Homily graduated from the uh, University of Illinois College of Dentistry in 1975. He served for two years as a Naval Dental Officer at Marine Corps Air Station, Cherry Point, North Carolina. Following that, he practiced restorative dentistry for nearly 20 years in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, during that time, he had seven university affiliations and received numerous awards and honors for service in dental associations and private teaching institutes. During the second half of his uh, clinical career, uh, Paul expanded his work in consultant and trainer, and since 1986, he has coached dentists, team members, laboratories, and salespeople, consultants, academians, uh, and key opinion leaders on dental speaking and coaching. Dr. Paul Homley retired from clinical practice in 1995 and now devotes his full-time focus to training, coaching, consulting, and authoring. Dr. Homley is a member of the American Dental Association and is licensed to practice dentistry in the state of North Carolina. Today, you are one of the top coaches in communication and speakers in dentistry. So, uh, Dr. Homley, it is my pleasure to have you on the guest today. And um, I know you've authored books and have lecturing tapes, and I've, I've written, uh, I've read and listened to all of those, and it's, it's uh, truly an honor to be speaking with you today. Well, Phil, thanks, thanks for having me. You know, um, my relationship with you actually started before you were a dentist. Your, your dad, uh, John Gordon, and I are buddies from many, many years ago. And your dad is one of the premier dentists that I've ever met. And I remember you before you were a dentist uh, in your dad's office. So, Phil, thanks for having me. And boy, listening to my bio, that's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. But, you know, I, I've enjoyed the practice of dentistry. I love it. I'm still in it. And I still have my foot on the gas. And there's so many really exciting things going on in dentistry. You know, we've got more advances and terrific advances in the whole digital landscape, 3D imaging, uh, surgical guides, just an amazing array of technology. Not only the technology, but also the business systems are, ch are changing too. And we can talk a bit about that. So so, Phil, thanks for having me. So go ahead and fire away. What would you and your listeners like to know? Let's just first start off. I know you've got a lot of books and courses that you offer. Just kind of take a, take a brief moment and break down your, your kind of primary uh, books and, and coaching that, that you do uh, and, and have done in the past with your, with your YES program and consulting and uh, speaking programs. Okay. Well, um, you know, to give you some perspective here, I practice dentistry from 19... 75 to 1995 and for the last since 95 till today that's what 21 years <laughs> it's a long time uh for the last 21 years i have consulted spoke written five books that literally been around the world in terms of helping dentists really manifest the best versions of themselves in the practice of dentistry you know uh, a, a real foundational program that i that I teach either as a workshop or as a seminar. It's a program called Making It Easy for Patients to Say Yes. It's really designed for practitioners who really want to do more of the dentistry they love, designed for creating grateful patients, all the while where, where dentists and team members are exquisitely compensated. I believe that if a dentist is struggling with his or her practice, if they're not enjoying it, Phil, they're, they're doing something wrong. De dentistry can be joyful when it's when when the patient's preferences are respected, and making it easy for patients to say yes really does that in a very very specific way. A, a big part of my work also includes training and the development of key opinion leaders. This is probably one of the biggest growth areas in my business now. Uh, I wrote a book called Just Because You're an Expert Doesn't Make You Interesting, and it's designed for content experts to become influential and memorable. I lead the Speakers Academy for Ormco Noble BioCare, 
I led it for years for the Serona and, and the CEREC system. I worked extensively with Pacific Dental Services and their offerings. Um, so th- that whole aspect of my career, that is speaker and key opinion leader development, is a very big part of what I do. Finally, uh, now I'm currently involved with some new business aspects, some new business entities that have evolved in dentistry. And, and a little bit later on in this in this interview, Phil, let's talk about some of the business models that are evolving now in dentistry, corporate practices, non-equity DSOs, group practices, that type of thing. And I, and I can tell you what I see happening there and what my roles are. Yeah, that, that'd be great. I'm definitely interested in the uh, all the trends that you see happening across the country and uh, the, the, the new age of practice management and practice growth. Uh, first, let's dive into, kind of take me back again. I know you practice dentistry for close to 20 years. You were one of the early kind of pioneers diving into implant dentistry in what I think is kind of its, its infancy stage. Now, you placed a lot of implants in your practice. What, how did you get started in implant dentistry? And, and kind of tell me how, how that progressed in your uh, clinical career. Well, it really started when I was in the Navy. I was stationed at Cherry Point, North Carolina, as you mentioned in my introduction. There, uh, my commanding officer, uh, Dr. Lou Muldrow, kind of paired me up with uh, Dr. Mel Davis. Mel uh, was an advanced general dentist who had a kind of a subspecialty in oral surgery. He was our oral surgeon, and Mel and I worked in the same in the same hallway. We shared. Uh, a hallway with adjacent operatories. And for two years, Mel really coached me on third molars. I assisted Mel in some of his surgeries. By the time I got out of the military, Phil, I was very comfortable with flap management, hard and soft tissues, uh, hemostasis, um, management of pain, anesthesia, all of the oral surgery aspects of dental alveolar surgery. So when I got out of the military, I attended a course um, at, uh, at, at Forsyth University, I think it was Forsyth in Boston, and it was a six-day surgical technique course on dental implants. There I met a fellow named Dr. Harold Robbins. Harold practiced in Port Charlotte, Florida. He and I became really, really close. Harold was just a champ. And he invited me down to Port Charlotte. He said, bring a couple patients, and we'll put us some implants together. He says, I'll, I'll be your mentor. So, uh, i never forget this. Um, it was about a week after that, a patient came in. His name was Bob Heimer. Bob worked for Seagram's, the alcohol company. He was a distributor. <laughs> He'd go from restaurants and bars and things like that and sell his stuff. Bob was 31 years old. He was totally edentialist. He was a veteran of the United States Air Force. I um, recommended to Bob uh, a, a ramus frame implant. I also had another patient. Um, Gail Britton, she was uh, partially dentalist on her lower right side. I brought Gail and Bob down to Port Charlotte, Florida. Uh, Harold uh, coached me. I placed a ramus frame implant in Bob Heimer and a ramus blade implant in, um, in um, Gail. Uh, you know what the funny thing is here, Phil? I got a phone call about a month ago from Bob Heimer. He still has his frame. His frame has been in place 30 nine years. <laughs> I think that's a record. Anyway, from that experience, from that experience, Harold and I uh, became very collegial. We formed the South Florida Implant Study Club. Bill Tatum was in that. Mark Davis was in that. For Turner. Maybe these are names you're not familiar with, but back then, these were the leaders in implant dentistry in the southeastern part of the United States. And and frankly, Bill, I, I, I'm, I did what you're doing now in that I just kept my foot on the gas. I just studied and learned and found teachers and mentors. I marketed my practice extensively. Um, I got to the point where I, I, at the time I was practicing in a small Western rural community of Hildebrand, North Carolina. Uh, I moved my practice to Charlotte, hired an associate, uh, and ultimately was able to generate 20 to 40 new implant patients a month. I did that for 20 years. I retired in 1995. Uh, prior to that, um, my good friend and colleague, Carl, Carl Misch, asked me to 
teach with him at the Mish Implant Institute, Carl and his brother Craig and me and four or five other faculty members kind of figured out uh, a lot of really cool things. Carl is amazing. I believe Carl is one of the finest implant dentists in the world. He was a, a, a very important mentor to me. And so after 20 years, uh, I had implanted and restored about 4,500 partially or totally edentulous patients with implants. And the list goes on and on. But to, to get started, what really started me was my surgical experience in the Navy. I'll tell you another thing that really was big for me was attending the L.D. Pankey Institute. L.D. Pankey Institute to this day, I believe, is one of the finest teaching centers in the world. Also, what they do at the Dawson Center, I went through the Dawson course, Pete and his whole teaching faculty down there at the Dawson Center, the Pankey Institute, gave me the confidence and the knowledge in the restorative aspect that allowed my implants to survive. You see, it's, it's controlling the biological forces on the implants. Even the early implants still, biologically and mechanically and structurally, they weren't the most scientifically validated uh, modalities in the world. But you know, if you, if, you protected, if you protected the implant, protected the implant from uh, too much occlusal force, placed it in a healthy patient, we got excellent long-term results, even with simple systems. So that's how I got my start, Bill. Yeah, you've got a, an amazing story, Paul, because you, know, you, you touched on a lot of important things there. One is uh, the key thing that keeps coming back up is, is good mentoring. And I put mentoring and CE in the same category because I feel like they have to be one in one. Um, and, and, you know, you mentioned meeting me at an early career. You know, you definitely inspired me to uh, branch outside of my comfort level with my uh, implants and speaking and uh, patient management. But you, you talked about, you know, going and working with people that were willing to teach you, show you, uh, but also going to the to the institutes and getting the training at Pinky and Dawson and, you know, Mish, you know, those are. Those are definitely uh, some of the biggest names in, in dentistry uh, maybe ever. So, you know, you're, you're very fortunate to have been exposed to those people and those ideas early in your career at a time when implants were, um, you know, still very early uh, in its development, I guess. So that's great. Yeah. Well, you know, um, Bill, let me back up a little bit. You know, I wasn't lucky that I was exposed to it. I, I got off my ass and I pursued it, you know. I, I work with many, many dentists, and, and frankly, there's a lot of dentists that I hear, oh, yeah, we want to do bigger cases, and we, we want to be able to do full mouth reconstructions or, or just partial mouth reconstructions. And then I'll ask, well, have you gone to the institute? So you mentioned, oh, no, you know, we've got family, and, you know, at, at some point, you know, it's like this, Phil. Everybody wants to go to heaven. Nobody wants to die. And... Frankly, if, if you want to excel in dentistry, you're going to have to get beyond what you learned in dental school. Find good mentors, get off your wallet, pay the tuition, go to the institutes. It's an investment. And uh, the smart dentists, the dentists like you, like your dad, have done that. So now it's not a matter of luck, it's a matter of will. It's a matter of specifically saying, what do I want to accomplish? And if you want to accomplish it, then there's certain things you need to do in preparation to make it happen. And, and frankly, watching online videos is not enough. You know, I had one advantage. And this is going to sound odd. I learned my stuff before the era of the Internet. I couldn't sit in front of my computer and watch videos. I, I wasn't seduced into that, but rather I had to go to the mouth. I had to find a relationship and a mentor to make it happen. Now, don't get me wrong, Phil. I'm not against online videos. I'm not. But as a prime educational source, I think it could be dangerous, and I think it's misleading. The videos make it look too easy. So take the time, get off your wallet, find a mentor, Enroll in advanced occlusal courses, get involved with different teaching institutions, and, and then you'll be on your way. Yeah, you know, I definitely couldn't agree more. Um, and that's part of the reason why I wanted to do this podcast, because I wanted to start kicking in doors and find out who's really got the best stuff and who's really doing what. So, uh, one, I, you know, selfishly, I just wanted to help my own path and my journey. But, you know, I want to expose people to, you know, who the right people are. And, and, and in a way to do it, because yeah, I, I totally agree, it's not about 
you know, you just fall in the right circumstance. You, you have to create your own luck. You have to get the training. You have to do the surgeries yourself. You have to, you know, train one-on-one -on -one, uh, in the mouth uh, because these things, uh, you, you just can't read them out of a book. You know, you don't get taught in dental school and, uh, you know, definitely watching online, uh, can help, but it's not, it's not really how you learn. So, so after you retired from dentistry clinically, uh, you, you kind of started the second phase in your career, which was, you know, more teaching and lecturing and mentoring. Tell me about your progression through that over the years and, and what you're doing now. I know, uh, you, you know, you said you've written five books. You're you're lecturing all over the world. Who are you involved with right now, as far as your lectures and your uh, speaking engagements, and kind of where where is your time spent right now? I guess. Yeah, well, let, let me give you the path. You know, um, when, when I left the practice of dentistry, it was under duress. Still, uh, I had a, an eye disability. My right eye, the, the lateral rectus muscle of my right eye, ruptured, which caused my eye to cross severely. My right eye and I've had multiple surgeries on my eye, and I got to the point where I really lost uh, depth perception, and I, I could still practice, but at a very, very remedial level, nothing that required any eyesight. <laughs> so leaving dentistry, leaving the clinical aspect of dentistry was not by choice for me. I loved it. If I could, if I could do it, I'd still be doing it. However, that wasn't in the cards for me. So when I when I sold the practice, sold the building, and um, what I did is I kind of reminisced as you know what 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 did I accomplish in the twenty years that I practiced? And what I did was really unique at the time. Understand this is from seventy five to ninety five. I was a general dentist whose practice was exclusively implant reconstructive dentistry. I had general dental associates. I had some great associates, by the way, Dr. John Fish, Dr. Randy Klein, Chris Kibler. These are, these are good practitioners who helped me support the practice by managing the entire general side of the practice. So one, one tip that I'll toss out here, if you're, if you're a general dentist and, um, and are looking to build, let's say, a practice that's exclusively to reconstructive dentistry is, is to get a good associate in your practice that help you handle a lot of the loose ends as far as the bread and butter practice. So you've got the time and the uh, energy to devote to the implant practice. Anyway, I left practice and... Uh, I just kind of looked back on my career and I said, you know, what I did was unique. I would bet that other dentists would love to learn how to do it too. So I formed a company called Homily Marketing Group. And what I did is I put on workshops and did private consulting for practitioners who wanted to build implant reconstructive practices. It was mainly general dentists. Your dad was one of my early clients still. And, um, I sent out a bunch of jumbo postcards. I really didn't know anything about putting on meetings or seminars, but boy, <laughs> I found out soon enough. Uh, my workshops filled up almost immediately. Um, I did probably four to six of these. And these were two-day workshops. I ended up writing a book called Dentist and Endangered Species. That's when, when managed care first started coming into dentistry. There was a lot of uh, anxiety about managed care. Uh, while I was teaching, as I was teaching the workshops, it, it became real obvious that dentists needed the wisdom that I had kind of documented in a process where they could assimilate it. So I wrote another book called, Isn't It Wonderful When Patients Say Yes? Five years later, I wrote Making It Easy for Patients to Say Yes. And between all of that, I created videos and audios and all of the stuff that you'd expect for an educator to have. And, and, and what's, what's interesting, what's interesting is that I really rediscovered something about myself. So when I was in undergrad, I was an English major. I enjoyed writing. I enjoyed speaking. I enjoyed the communication process. But frankly, in the practice of dentistry, I really didn't exercise that too much. So now that I was kind of in a seminar and workshop business, it sort of gave me permission to kind of dust off some of those old skills. I joined the National Speakers Association. I joined the National Storytellers Association. 
I enrolled in a, a group of entrepreneurs called the Strategic Coach Program. We met four times a year. I did that for 10 years. Uh, currently, I hold the highest earned designation in professional speaking in the world, the Certified Speaking Professional designation. I'm the only dentist in the world that has that designation. I did these workshops, and, and it really it really allowed me to step back from the dental care experience. That is, when, when you're in a dental office, Phil, you know this to be true. When, when you're working, it's hard to think. <laughs> you're working, you're, you're in a task environment. You got this task to do, you got this task to do, you run from chair to chair to chair. That's the practice of dentistry, I get that. And often at the end of the day, uh, you're physically tired, you're a little bit burned out, and the last thing you want to do is sit down and rethink the whole day. You want to go home and just kind of chill out. However, now that I didn't have the practice, I didn't have the distractions of patients, I didn't have the fatigue factor of practice in dentistry, and I had the privilege and the luxury of traveling all over the country, visiting and working with some of the best professionals, some of the most successful dentists, and looking at what they did. I also had the experience of working in god-awful doghouse dental practices and seeing what they did. And after a period of time, I began to notice patterns, different patterns. What, what do I see commonly in practices that are successful? What do I see in practices that are just struggling? What are the common denominators? What are the foundational elements of having a successful dental practice, let alone doing dental implants? And that really formed the basis for my, uh, uh, my books, my audios, my videos, and my teaching and my consulting. So that's really the start. Now, now it's 21 years later after I graduate, rather after I've left the practice of dentistry. What I'm doing now, my primary focus now is I'm looking at the business systems that dentists work under. You know, my work with case acceptance, my case acceptance process, making it easy for patients to say yes, I make incremental changes and improvements in that process every year. However, the bulk of the work is finished. Its process is proven. I, I have practitioners all over the world using it successfully. There's not a lot more that I need to do with that. Not saying that I don't, I don't provide incremental improvements to it, but the bulk of the foundational work is done. Where my new frontier resides is in the business system still. And uh, the business systems in dentistry, what I'm talking about is the, the expansion and the success of the corporate practices in dentistry, the expansion and success of dental service organizations. And I'm intimately involved in the, the, the meta economic aspects of the practice of dentistry where I, I don't so much focus on the solo provider anymore, but I focus on the larger groups, 10, 20, 30, 100, 300, 400 practices. That's where my work resides now, Phil. Yeah, you know, you touched on a lot of great points there. One of my biggest problems in working in clinical dentistry is I have all these great ideas, I want to do this and that, and then you run through the day and you're doing task, 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 and you can't kind of rise above the noise and create those moments of clarity to get things to the next level. So I think if people aren't disciplined or if they don't create those moments, they're just going to go from one chore to one chore to one chore and keep doing things the exact same way they always have. And uh, you, you've got to create a separation to kind of break outside of, okay, this is my clinical task and then break outside and go, how can I be a better leader? How can I be a better manager? How can I be inspirational or, or thinking uh, outside the box on this and, and an inventor? And so, you, you put all your energy towards that now, and it's, it's definitely showing that, you know, you're coming up with some revolutionary ideas, and you can focus solely on that, and I think that's great. You know, the, the limitation, you know, here's a, here's a basic principle, Phil, that you can absolutely take to the bank. Um, the limitation on the growth of a dental practice. When I say growth, here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a, a practice is growing when the dentist is doing the dentistry he or she loves. You, you got to do what you love. A, a, a practice is growing when patients are referring and grateful. A practice is growing when you're working with a team that's aligned. A practice is growing 
when you're being abundantly compensated. The practice is growing when you when you come into the practice. The whole process of the practice of dentistry brings you energy. There's a there's a psychological additive effect. It brings a person fulfillment and joy. Now, if that's not happening, something's not right. Now, that whole scene does not equate to the number of continuing education hours you have. Here's what I mean by that. A lot of practitioners who are not happy, who are not making enough money, who don't have a live case, who struggle to get new patients in the practice, oftentimes these practitioners feel, feel the solution to this problem is they need more clinical continuing education. So they go out and they take another course on bonding. They take another course on implant. They take another course on occlusion. They keep taking courses. They become AGD fellows, AGD masters. And after a while, they have all this accrued information, but they're still stuck. They're still stuck with a practice that's not fulfilling. It's not thriving. It's not bringing them energy. It's because, Phil, they see the solution to the practice as a technical or clinical solution. Phil, that's only half of it. The other half of it is the behavioral and the communication side of this thing. And unfortunately, the culture of dentistry, the culture in dentistry, I'm talking about dental schools, I'm talking about continuing education, I'm talking about its, its publications and its articles and its research and its association meetings, still almost exclusively focus on the technical aspects of dentistry. It's as if if we can do a better crown, we're going to be more successful. Well, that's true to a point. But after you learn to do a successful crown, you learn to place a successful implant. You learn to rehabilitate a mouth. That's only the first step. It's like if it wasn't for the patients, dentistry would be easy for a lot of dentists. There's a communication and there's a business aspect to it. And in the absence of that, dentists get stuck on this developmental plateau and they never get off it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think that's understated. I know you, you lecture to that all the time. I think, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a given that, I, that as a dentist, I need to stay up on the clinical CE. But what I don't think people understand is uh, it's not going to get you anywhere if people don't like you, if people aren't you know, if people don't like your staff, if you don't communicate well, if you're not selling the dentistry appropriately, you know, nobody buys dentistry from a dentist they don't like. And so, especially with these bigger implant cases or, or larger dentistry, they're buying uh, the dentist just as much as they are the procedure. So, um, I definitely try to focus on that um, aspect. And I know a lot of the other dentists should. Uh, as, as a nature, a lot of them are introverts and very awkward with, uh, you know, interactions. And so I think a lot of them could benefit from focusing on that aspect more. But also recently, a lot of the things that you, you spoke about, the business systems, case acceptance, um, larger growth practices, you know, you're seeing more of those trends nowadays. So, you know, you're spending more of your energy on bigger business models and bigger companies. If you could kind of talk about what you're seeing in the, the trends of dentistry and, and the trends in marketing and uh, kind of the the group practice uh, mentality or the, the trends in dentistry, that's definitely changed quite a bit uh, over the years, and you've had some exposure to that. C can you talk briefly about that? Sure. You know, and Phil, that really relates to what we were just talking about. Here's a, here's a dentist. Take, you're a good example of this, Phil, and your dad is a good example of this, too, as are many dentists who are really committed to doing a great job. You're taking all the clinical CE, you're buying all the technology, you're, you've invested in your, your facility, you're traveling to attend courses, you're reading articles, and, and on top of all that, you're practicing four or five days a week. So here's the big question. Here's the big question. When does a practitioner find time to work on the behavioral and the uh, psychological and the emotional aspects of the practice of dentistry. Here's the answer. Most of them don't have the time because in addition to the practice, they got families, they got hobbies, they got a life outside the dentistry. Now, here's the rub. Here, here is the rub. If a dentist is all dressed up in terms of his ability or her ability to provide the dentistry, especially implant dentistry, Phil, 
Implant dentistry is one of the most sophisticated service offerings that we have. It involves complex patients, complex technology, complex, complex labs, high fees, high involvement with insurance companies, associates, all of that stuff is going on. Now, without proper leadership and proper management, proper business systems, the practice of implant dentistry will stall because you, it, you'll get, I call it transaction drag. There's so much going on. The dentist gets pulled in so many different directions. So what's the solution? Well, a lot of dentists will go out and hire an office manager. That's a good start. However, however, in a busy multi-doctor practice, an office manager oftentimes does not have the skill set to really evaluate the, the business environment that the practice is in. What, what, is the, what are the best payers for insurance? Who are the best uh, patient financing firms to deal with? How about human resources, all the laws and regulations related to human resources? Who's going to train the staff? Who's going to hold the staff accountable? What about facility? What about transition? All these questions still just blow up. They just expand in every direction to where most dentists just want to just put their head down and just let me fix the teeth. And it's that, it, it's, it's a surrender to the complexity of the practice that creates a limitation. Now, all of that being said, there's, there's an entity that exists in us today and it's growing. It's called Dental Service Organization. Now, let me clear up some nomenclature. We've all heard the word and the phrase corporate dentistry. And what pops into mind is big, big groups like Heartland and Pacific and Western Dental and Aspen and these groups. And incidentally, I'm going to name names as we go along here and understand I have good working relationships with all of the corporate um, entities out there. I've done programs for them. I've done workshops for them. And it's just not lousy dentists who join the organizations. I've met many highly qualified, highly motivated, terrific dentists who practice in the corporate environment. I, I get kind of put off, Phil, when people thumb their nose at the corporate dentist. Well, these are bad dentists. I guarantee you, I absolutely guarantee you that corporate dentistry right now only occupies anywhere, I think the number is like 12 to 15 percent of all of dentists. There are more lousy dentists in private practice than there are in all of the corporate practices put together. So let's not point fingers, number one. A, a dental service organization, which the corporate practice can be classified as, but I want to talk about a, a different entity called the dental service organization, where an organization typically uh, either owned or not owned by business people offer business services to dentists. And here's the big difference, Phil. The dental service organization, the dental service organization does not own the dental practice. The dentist owns the dental practice 100%. The dentist has complete control over the type and kinds of dentistry they do. However, the dental, the dental service organization helps deal with all those factors that I was talking about earlier the insurance and the human resource and the facility and the transition, all of that stuff is handled by the dental service organization for a percentage of the collections of their dental practice. So it's a variable expense. And it's the dental service organization that I see, Phil, as a huge emerging trend in dentistry that, that practitioners like yourself who want to build uh, sophisticated practices need to look at because see, once the business aspects of a practice are being managed well and professionally, then the clinical aspects can really take off. And whether it's accounting or data or business intelligence or marketing or human resources or all those things that go into the practice of dentistry, when those are managed professionally and competently, that frees the dentist time up, Bill, to do more of the dentistry they love, to build relationships with patients, and to get the sense that they're not on a treadmill or in a task-centered environment. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the, the things that you talked about are all the things that I think dentists uh, gripe about the most, you know, the problems with 
insurance, the problems with HR, the problems with their employees, hiring and firing, all the, uh, you know, keeping up with all the business oriented things that they don't like to do. They're not trained to do. They typically have their spouse maybe do it and they don't like it. And so, you know, you run into all these issues where a lot of dentists just want to be a good dentist and they don't want to be a good business person too. So I think, you know, uh, you, know, you, you take the baby boomer generation who maybe started a practice and for a while was okay doing those things. But now as the uh, progression of the economies have changed, times have changed, the business of dentistry has changed. They don't like to keep up with that anymore. It's gotten too big, too complex. Maybe the younger generation doesn't come in and understand it. So you're seeing much more dentists that are wanting or, or needing to deal with those headaches. So the DSOs are coming in and saying, okay, we have a solution and we can uh, present an opportunity to help you with those for, like you said, a portion of the fee. And for a lot of people, that makes sense. Yeah. You know, and when, when you look at DSO organizations, you know, there's good ones and there's bad ones. It's just like there's good practices and bad practices, Bill. So look for DSO organizations that, number one, really have experience. Number two, look for those that have dentists who are serving as a chief dental officer or at some level at the corporate leadership level. So it's just not a bunch of business people. You need to have someone or a group of people who are familiar with the customs, the jargon, and the culture of the practice of dentistry. It's not a retail business. It's, it's a relationship business. And so when you look at a DSO to help you um, uh, build your practice, Look for ones with a track record. Look for ones with, with dental officers and dental people, dental experience. And then ask them for referrals for other dentists who are clients of theirs to get their experience with working with the DSO. I, Phil, here's what I know absolutely to be true. If I was in the practice of dentistry today doing what I was doing, that is treating all implant patients and doing reconstructive dentistry, and, and having multiple associates and maybe looking at alternative facilities, extension facilities that is building an enterprise business, I would absolutely have a relationship with a dental service organization. So if I got an issue, if I'm going to buy equipment or I need to get uh, um, uh, operating capital or if I need to make a loan or if I'm going to uh, add on to my facility or if I want to fire somebody or if I want to hire somebody, I can deal with the dental service organization and they can help me facilitate all this Why I'm focused on what matters most. That is creating grateful patients, aligning my team and doing the dentistry I love. It's exactly what I would be doing right now. And I think a lot of people maybe have those aspirations, but they're just spinning their wheels on the ground level and they're, and they're never going to get off. They're never going to get the plane off the ground because it takes so much work just to get you know an airplane off the ground, but once you get up above the clouds, you can really coast. And I think you know these organizations can help get you to that higher level to where you can focus your energy on just cruising and doing the things that you do best. Yeah. Plus, see, when you're in a dental service organization, let's say this this DSO has 40 or 50 practices associated with it. Now you've got another community of dentists who could possibly be mentors, or you might be a you may belong to a DSO that had 40 or 50 members that would give you greater opportunities for mentorship, or maybe you become a mentee in that situation. There's more social interaction. And because you have mutual vested interest, the vested interest is that you want to attract the most successful, the most learned, the most uh, productive dentist to join the DSO with you because the more successful the DSO becomes, the more the DSO entity can pour into continuing education. They can pour into bringing the best speakers to your area where you don't have to get on a jet and go somewhere. They can bring it to you. Plus, when you're in a community of dentists, you can, you, you can be exposed to best practices relative to hygiene, relative to scheduling, relative to case acceptance. You know what I'm saying, Phil? Oh, yeah. Because I think, you know, you might be able to try one thing and try another thing next year and try another thing next year. But if you've got a community where there's 100 offices and everybody tries one thing, you've got 100 different philosophies that have been tested. 
and you know which one would work. You know which one to integrate. And so it allows you to use the best practices of 100, 200, 400 offices and put them all into one. So you're not having to fight all those failures on your own. You've got a, a group uh, and, a, and a sounding board to work with and some leadership from above that, that could help you with that. Absolutely, yes. Now, do you see more people getting into DSOs um, right out of school? Or do you see more people who have maybe in a practice and they don't want to work as much, and so they're kind of buying into the DSO or selling into the DSO? Or it is obviously there's probably a mixture of that. Or, or do you see people saying, I own a practice, I want to own five practices, I want to work with you and kind of be the implant dentist at all five of them, but have associates at all five? I mean, where, where do you see those people coming into different levels of working in different DSOs? I know there's a lot of programs out there and they all do it differently. You know, what, what kind of trends have you seen with that? Well, you know, Phil, my first practice, the very first practice I was in was a dental service organization. I don't know if you knew that or not. I'd walk in. I didn't hire any of the employees, although I had influence on them. I walked in. The schedules were full. All of the supplies were handled by a supply specialist, the facilities, a facility specialist. I worked with more experienced practitioners alongside of me. It was the probably I could not imagine a better scenario for myself as a young practitioner. The name of that DSO was called the United States Navy. The Navy and the armed forces are a great way for practitioners to get a start. I can't over I can't overstate that. My experience with the Navy, see, I was in the Air Force prior to going to Dell School, Phil. I was an airman stationed at Lackland Air Force Base, Wright Patterson Air Force Base, Wiesbaden Air Station in Germany. It was in Wiesbaden. I was accepted to dental school, went four years of dental school, went right back into the Navy. That's why I got my surgical experience. So a young practitioner coming out of dental school right now, military duty, absolutely, really, really smart. I see other um, young practitioners coming out of schools, going into the large corporate entity like Heartland, like Pacific, like Western. And there, you know, there's some advantage there. There's, there's no, they don't have to take 10 cents out of their pocket to join those organizations. It gives them, it gets them up to speed as far as their technical skills are concerned. Uh, it allows them to begin to pay down their student debt. It gives them uh, opportunities to uh, build collegiality with other dentists just to kind of get their foot on the ground. Um, some dentists stay in those corporate entities for, you know, maybe a year or three just to kind of get up to speed and then they move on to other situations. Other dentists remain in the, the corporate entities and begin to build enterprise practices where they uh, may own or have partial ownership in multiple practices. So I can't tell you the number of dentists that I know that make amazing net incomes, far more than I ever made as a dentist, who own three or four general practices and they practice a couple days a week. The other couple days, they go from practice to practice acting as a mentor to younger dentists and keeping the ship afloat. Now, are these practitioners doing advanced um, implant reconstructive dentistry? No. These basically are bread and butter practices, which, by the way, are the, it's the backbone of the uh, dentistry in the United States. It's the bread and butter practice. So young practitioners have lots of really good choices out there right now, Phil. My first choice, the military. That would be my first choice. My second choice, if I was coming off right now, I'd probably look at a, a big entity like a Pacific Dental Services. I've done a lot of work with Pacific. I really like their leadership. I think Steve, Steve Thorne and his group, Joe Felsine, have done a great job. Yeah, you could say, well, you know, these corporate practices, I don't know about this. I don't want that. Hey, listen, um, the, the, the experiences that I've had, I've been inside these organizations. And if I was a young guy and I was looking, or a young practitioner, and I was looking at putting myself in a safe environment where, let me change here. If I, if I was a young practitioner and looking to put myself in a safe environment, I'd look at a Pacific Dental or something like a Pacific Dental to, you know, get me comfortable. And from there, uh, then there's many forks on the road from there, Phil. 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's not just, uh, I think what you're saying is there's not just one way to do it. And then depending on the uh, type of practitioner, the uh, experience that they have, the personality that they have, the uh, what they're wanting to do, there might be different avenues to uh, look into for all those. And uh, they could yeah. fall into any, any one of those categories and have a successful relationship. Yeah. And, you know, and we've been talking about, we've been talking about the young practitioner. There's even as much or more benefit for the more seasoned practitioner. You, 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 you take yourself, Bill, or your dad, you know, you're in your community, you've got a referral base there, patients know you, the community knows you, you're not about to run off and join a big corporate practice or join the military, but rather you're going to stay in your community and you're going to try to thrive in your, in your community. That's when I would, especially if you're building a sophisticated practice, then that's when I would look at the dental service organization there. That way you don't have to leave. You don't have to leave your environment and you don't have to sell your practice. So anyway, that's my two cents on that. Kind of switching gears here a little bit again. You talked about marketing your practice back in the 80s and 90s when uh, marketing for dental implants as a uh, general practitioner was probably pretty risky for a lot of reasons. You know, you were a, a general dentist. And back then, marketing uh, in dentistry was, was pretty unknown uh, and frowned upon in the profession. If, if you were placing implants today, how would you market yourself and how would you use certain systems to maximize your, uh, I guess, outcomes and advantages? You know, what, what systems do you see out there being used for general dentists that are working well? You know, what, what actual you know, protocols or marketing strategies do you see out there that could um, take someone like myself who, who wants to do more implants? You know, what, what direction should I start looking at? Well, uh, you know, let me start with the biggest picture here. Um, as a general practitioner doing dental implants, if I, was, if I was that general practitioner doing implants, Phil, so here's what I would do today. I would build a relationship with one or more surgical specialist, either oral surgeons or periodontists. I would build a relationship with them. Then I would look to other um, implant, general, general implant dentists in my community. Let's say you know five or six guys, Phil, in your community that kind of want to do what you're doing. And they're kind of spread all over Kansas City. Kansas City's got a big geographical footprint. I mean, it's very expansive. And uh, what I would do is build a cooperative marketing plan. That is, I would have the, all the practitioners, the surgical specialists and the general dentist, everybody chip into a um, combined fund, and I would market the entire region, the entire region. And the reason that I'm saying that is that when you look at television advertising, when you look at radio advertising or major newspaper print advertising, they, these advertising uh, opportunities can be purchased where you can purchase the full market or partial market. Uh, well, if you, if you have the power of combined purchasing power, you can purchase the entire market. Then I would use something like a, uh, a, a computerized phone system to where when a caller responds to an ad, their phone number uh, directs their call to the office nearest them. Domino's Pizza does that kind of thing. Uh, it's called interactive voice recognition. That way, I would have the best of all worlds. Number one, I would, I would place the, the bulk of the surgical responsibilities on the surgical specialist. Now, I know that's probably not the direction that you would want to go in this conversation. Many general dentists feel or want to place their own implants. I'm fine with that. However, if I want to eliminate complexity, if I want to focus on what I'm most profitable at, and I want to build in the most profound medical legal environment, I would cooperate more with the surgical specialist especially for the partial, the full arch implants, the all on four, that kind of thing. Maybe for a single dental implant, maybe that's fine. Uh, but it's not like when I was in practice, Phil. I would say what I would do right now 
would be I would look at a combined marketing campaign to where I had multiple practitioners, multiple specialists, and I would dominate the market in terms uh, uh, that my combined purchasing power would allow me to do. In order to pull something like that off, you need strong leadership here. A dental service organization can do that with you, or you can do it on your own, but you'd have to hire a local advertising and marketing agency to design the ads, do the purchasing, uh, set up the re response technology. What I, here's what I would not do. Here's what I would not do. I would not try to go it on my own. Um, if you go it on your own, you're going to be spending quite a bit of dough, quite a bit of money for probably not a lot of response. Now, you could get into Internet and web and all of that, but you know what? Everybody else is, too. Well, I think there's a lot to chew on there. I mean, I think, uh, you know, ultimately what you're saying is, you know, it's, it, it's a uh, relationship still with the surgical specialist. There is a relationship with the other dentists in town. So there's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not maybe an isolated approach, and, there, and there's different ways to do that. So I think there can be uh, maybe in smaller markets. Yeah, it is. Uh, you know, it is just a, a small group and maybe a study club and a, and a specialist, but maybe in a bigger market, it's a handful of practices and, uh, you know, a handful of specialists. So I think there's, there's a lot of different ways to approach that. Yeah. You know, we're all trying to solve the same problem. You see, that's where dentistry needs to grow up. Den dentistry is a cottage industry. and Dentists tend to practice in isolated solo offices. And th that thinking needs to go away. Not that the solo practice is wrong, Phil, but when, you, when you're looking at economies of scale, when you're looking at combined purchasing power, we're all trying to, all the dentists are trying to solve the same problem. We want quality new patients. We want the marketing that is the most efficacious. We want to be able to do it without breaking the bank. We want to be able to market our practices intelligently. And guess what? Most dentists don't know squat about marketing. It's not our expertise. Marketing people don't know a lot about dentistry either. So why don't everybody do what they do best? If we're all trying to solve the same problem, doesn't it make perfect sense for us to unite and do it in such a way that we can that everybody benefits with a fraction of the cost to the practitioners? Plus, the side benefit is that you're building collegiality, you're building community with other like-minded dentists, and so you you don't you don't think about the other dentists as competitors, you think about them as collaborators. That's my opinion. Yeah, for sure. When it comes to different academies to join, what's your interaction with uh, various implant academies? Do you know much about various, uh, like the AAID or, you know, American Academy of General Dentistry, the American Academy of Implant Dentistry, American Academy of Osseo Integration? Do, do you have much um, to do with any of those? I, I used to. I, I was a, uh, a very involved, very energetic, very proud member of the American Academy of Implant Dentistry. Um, I uh, made great relationships with, with in that organization. And so if I'm a general practitioner uh, who wants to do more dental implants, I would certainly think that American Academy of Implant Dentistry, that's AAID, would be a great choice. Uh, so is the International College of Oral Implantology, the ICOI. And, and there's, but Phil, you know, I, I don't, because I'm not practicing anymore, I don't attend the academy meetings unless I'm a speaker. And so as, as far as, you know, the leadership of those organizations now and, and the benefits to the practitioners, I, I really can't advise on that. I'm, I'm really not the source for that. Sure. Understood. You know, in, in looking at, at kind of the global picture and kind of looking into kind of wrapping this up a bit, what would be your three best practices to somebody who says, uh, you know, I'm looking to grow my practice just in, in general uh, and, and in implant dentistry moving forward. Uh, I'm looking to further my career. I'm looking to further my uh, professional growth. What, what are the three best practices that you can give out to people? Um, I think number one would be either form or join a community of like-minded dentists. That might be a study club. That might be a mastermind. That might be something that a a person puts together on their own. But number one would be, you know, find people who are doing what you want to do and, and hang out with them. 
<laughs> it's, it's, it sounds so simple, but not a lot of people do that. Okay. So, so find dentists who are doing what you want to do or willing to take, get on the journey with you as collaborators. That would be number one. Number two, I would seriously look into getting uh, a dentist health and nutrition up to speed. I guarantee you, Phil, how long have you been in practice right now? How many years? Seven years. Seven years. I guarantee you, 10 years from now, your back is going to hurt, your ass is going to hurt, your eyes are going to hurt, your wrists are going to hurt. Okay? The practice of dentistry is very physical. And unless a practitioner uh, really is careful about their physical health, the physical health issues sideline so many dentists. I'm 67 right now, Phil. And I see dentists who've been practicing 20 years, 30 years that are, they're, they're disabled now that they just keep on practicing under pain, under duress. If a practitioner doesn't physically take care of themselves, talking about nutrition, exercise, spirituality, all of the aspects of health and wellness, that's got to be really big in a dentist's life because it's physical. We're not like radiologists who are reading x-rays. We're bending, we're reaching, we're using our eyes, we're using our hands. We need to stay physically up to speed. Number three, my third tip, uh, a general practitioner, I'm talking, and I would assume you're talking about an experienced solo general practitioner wants to go to practice. I would, I would look into a high quality dental service organization. I would look into a high quality dental service organization and, and, and get the business and the marketing and the legal and the human resource and all of those loose ends that we were talking about earlier. I would get professionals to do that. Just like Phil, you, you don't file your own taxes. You get an accountant for that. You don't defend yourself in court. You have an attorney for that, right? We hire business specialists, but we do it on one off basis. What if those specialists, what if those business specialists were focused on the success of your practice? Dentists need to begin to think along those lines. So number one, find or build a community of mentors or, or co-journeymen. Number two, take care of yourself physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And number three, get business professionals in there to help you grow your practice. So. Yeah, you know, I can, I can speak uh, on experience for all those being very important and and i uh have to look at those each you know monthly and yearly and make sure i'm doing that because uh it's a it's a tough road to hoe on your own and uh you know if you don't have the mentors and your health and some professional collaborative efforts working with you you know it's something's bound to to get you and tear you down so you you've got to have some aces in your pocket working for you too so absolutely hey you know if, if your listeners if your listeners want to learn more about the kind of stuff I'm doing, just come to my website, www.paulhomily.com. I have a second website that's really designed for the key opinion leader. Aspect. The key opinion leader aspect of my work is growing. Uh, if, if you're a dentist or a team member who wants to teach, wants to travel a bit and give seminars and that kind of thing, uh, it's a great way to extend a career. Go to my website. It's called theinterestingexpert.com, theinterestingexpert.com. So for people who want to know more, paulhomley.com is more about dentistry. Theinterestingexpert.com is more about speaking and key opinion leadership, Bill. Yeah, that's great. And I know, uh, like I said, I've, I've bought and, and listened to and read about everything you have. So I think that's the next step for me is to, is to get to your uh key opinion workshop and that's definitely on my to-do list this year so um i guess you know that was that was one of the next things is how how should people get a hold of you and i guess those two websites is probably the best place to do it huh yeah and in my personal email is my name paul at paulhomily.com but the best bet go to the websites there's contact you know you contact information i've got an administrative team that handles all that for me and uh, if people want to talk, uh, that's fine, too. We can schedule phone appointments, um, that kind of thing. So um, it, I'm pretty easy to get a hold of, Phil. Great. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And, and that's made a world of difference for me. I can speak personally and you know, really appreciate everything you've done for me over the years. 
So in, in closing here, Paul, if you had to come up with three other people uh, that you think I should interview, who would those three people be? And I guess, uh, I, you know, I asked this about everybody in two, uh, you know, who, is there any way you could put me in contact with them to, to ask uh, time for them for a podcast? Let, let me think about that. Let me think about that. I'll just shoot you an email and, and that way you'll have it. But I need to give that some thought. Perfect. And, and uh, I guess knowing me and the journey that I'm on, you can uh, you can determine who that would be, but I'm uh, you know trying to like I said I've got I've got two selfish reasons for this podcast. One is to kind of help me in my career. I'm I'm doing what you said. I'm trying to find people that are better than I and that have uh, done it before and trying to learn from them. Uh, and and two, if I can if I can share some knowledge with somebody else who's on the same journey, then that you know hopefully takes some stress off their plate. So that's very cool. Hey, Phil. Hey, thanks for this. This has been fun for me. Hey, and say hello to your dad for me and your mom. Will do. Yeah, I know. Uh, I know my uh, my dad told me to tell you hello, and I'll look to uh, I'll look to get out there to your your center in Scottsdale here soon. Okay. All right. Bye, my friend. All right. Thanks, Paul.